Uh, start to wind down here, and uh, I'm Chris Montferrat. I'm the uh, business development director for our undersea systems business area uh, for General Dynamics Mission Systems, and really excited to be here. Um, a great forum so far, great discussions. Uh, this particular forum is always one of my favorites at any symposium where you start to think and hear from the warfighter perspective and get some sense of what the warfighter community is doing. Um, that kind of rounds out rounds out the story for, for me. You know, you hear about technology, you hear about what the sponsors are doing, you hear about the requirements side and the funding side, but uh, you start to hear things like um, Vice Admiral Johnson's story yesterday. What are the warfighters doing? They're taking a 3D printer to see so that they can make spare parts, right? And that starts to tell you the kinds of problems that they're facing and the perspective that we need to have in terms of our innovation and where we're putting our money. So, um, as I said, I really enjoy these sessions and, and I think this one will be outstanding as we have, um, you know, two very qualified uh, speakers that are going to go through and give you uh, give you their perspectives. Uh, the other thing is how do we marry up our innovation and investment? And I know any of you staying for uh, Antex over the next few days will get the opportunity to see some demonstrations in technology, and uh, maybe get we'll be we'll have the opportunity to get some war, warfighter feedback as they see the kinds of things that we're working on. So if you do have an opportunity to swing by and see some of the demonstrations that are going on. I think that'll be outstanding as well uh, to tie it all together from an innovation and technology point of view. Um, okay, so our panel today, our first uh, panelist is Dr. William Burnett. Dr. Burnett is the technical director to the Commander Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command slash Task Group 80.7. They gave me a mouthful on that one. Is yeah, I know. <laughs> Tongue know. twister. Yeah, we do that. <laughs> In this role, he provides technical responsibility and oversight for a fleet of six survey ships, 2,000 civilian and military personnel, and a budget of over $300 million. Dr. Burnett also serves as a computational technology area leader in climate, weather, and ocean for the Department of Defense's High Performance Computing Modernization Office. And uh, his full bio is in the back, but if there's a little fun fact in there, if you didn't uh, didn't catch that, he began his career in '85 as a storm chaser. So uh, maybe be a question or two at the end about about that. Uh, Donald Hoffer is the executive director, submarine forces. Mr. Hoffer currently serves as the executive director, of submarine forces, where he's the principal advisor to the submarine force commander on all matters relating to undersea warfare programs and requirements. He's the senior civilian in the submarine force, and his responsibilities include the prioritization of future submarine force capabilities, resources, undersea technology, and the implementation of unmanned systems in the undersea. He serves on numerous senior advisory panels, including the USD ATL's Long Range Research and Development Plan. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burnett. Great, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Another fun fact besides just being uh, a storm chaser, and I don't really know what that means except I was chased by storms quite a few times living in Oklahoma. Uh, this is actually the anniversary, 13th anniversary of Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina that went over the, uh, the uh, Mississippi coastline. I'm sure you've all heard about it. Uh, I remember what I was doing 13 years ago today because I was at working at the National Data Buoy Center uh, and the eye of Katrina was going to go over the uh, Stennis Space Center, which is where we're located at. That was a long, long day, but being a meteorologist, it was kind of cool because I got to go through a hurricane, which I never thought in my life I'd go through, but at the same time, afterwards, it was not much fun at all, as you can all imagine. So there's a good side and, and a really bad side to it, and I don't really want to ever do that again. So. That was, a, that was one example of being chased by a storm, but uh, we have some of our folks from the great state of Mississippi sitting over there who uh, actually have their Katrina stories as well. It's just weird that today is uh, the anniversary. We, we did Antex, part of Antex, down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and last week we had sort of our event coupled to this event, and I, as a meteorologist, I said, I know for a shadow of doubt that we're gonna have a hurricane that's gonna come over the area on the 21st of August just because 
that's what we do. When we have a big event that's going to have, that meteorologists are going to plan, plan for the worst. And actually, we had a cold front that came through, and it was colder or cooler here than it was in, uh, than it is today. So just, uh, you never know how things are going to work out. But we don't have any storms in the Atlantic, and that's a really good thing. Um, I'm honored to, to, uh, to be invited to speak today, especially honored to be uh, in a panel with uh, uh, Don Hoffer. Uh, he, his experience and knowledge at, at the senior executive level is, uh, is critical to the U.S. Navy and the submarine force. So it's, it's just a, a, a pleasure to be up here uh, to be able to talk to you today. Uh, we are located, I'm located at Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. This is our first time to do a advanced naval technology exercise. But we did last year an operational demonstration using unmanned systems, which allowed us to tie into how uh, being a part of Antex. And uh, I want to give a shout out to Team Newick Newport and, uh, and the great folks that are here. I know George is here, Betty Jester, who works down in George Spar is at New Newark Newport, but we steal him away a couple times uh, to, uh, to help us down at uh, Stennis Space Center. Betty Jester is, uh, is not here, but she's one who's a full-time employee that works with us as well. Great close collaboration and uh, just, uh, just a, a great group. And, and some of the things that you're going to see at Antex tomorrow and the next day and some of the accomplishments we had between both agencies, uh, hopefully you'll be uh, impressed by that. All right, let's go to the next slide. So our, uh, our bumper stickers, we provide the home field advantage to away games. That's what we do. And if the US Navy ever gets in a fight, it's our job to make sure it's not a fair fight. Uh, we have, as you heard in the bio, about 1,200 military and 1,200 civilians that are uh, operating worldwide. That's a uh, survey ship an oceanographic hydrographic survey ship that you see in the picture. We have six of them that are distributed all around the world. They, uh, they collect oceanographic and hydrographic data for us. And what we do is we have about 10, 15, 20 civilians that will go deploy on the ship and uh, for 30 days at a time, collect data, and then come back to Stennis. We have a high performance computing system, a supercomputer, one of DOD supercomputers, that takes all that data, uh, gets to a format that the US Navy can use, and then we package it up and send it out to the Navy so they understand what type of operating environment they're going to be in. So civilians, uh, high performance computing, survey ships. We also have uh, telescopes and astrophysicists at the US Naval Observatory that uh, help us understand where we're located at in the universe. It's really if you ever go to the U.S. Observatory, uh, Naval Observatory, have you seen that Star Trek episode, the one where the guys with the big giant heads, they're like green heads, and they don't talk to you, they just, the veins vibrate and they give thought processes right into you? That's what the astrophysicists are like at the uh, Naval <laughs> Observatory. They're really scary and... Uh, uh, how do you talk back? I, I don't talk back. They do... Uh, <laughs> Well, they, they read your minds. That's how they, so you don't have to do that. But uh, they always um, try to, try to. well, they, they're very, very smart people. They're some of the smartest people that we have in the, in the Department of Defense, and it's a pleasure to have them on our team as well. So for this talk, I want to uh, focus on data, the data collection part. I can go on and on about the Naval Observatory. And uh, as, a, as I said, survey ships are critical to the lifeblood of, of what we do and how we collect data. But there's got to be a way to synergistically bring in unmanned systems with our survey ships. And uh, that's, that's really where we're moving forward with autonomous vehicles and unmanned systems. What you see there is uh, our gliders, underwater gliders. We actually have one at our booth that's uh, located downstairs if you want to touch one. Uh, on the back of one of our survey ships. And you see the uh, title, 100 gliders equals world record. And there's a little story behind the, the gliders that you, uh, that you see there and that we have. We have 130 gliders in our inventory. And Don, he'll, he'll come down a couple times. We'll take him to the glider warehouse. You may have seen the glider warehouse if you visited. Uh, you see a lot of gliders sitting in the glider warehouse. And even though we had 130 gliders, we could only deploy 30 at a time. 30 was our maximum. 
we have 10 glider pilots. They're working 24 by 7 by 365 in the glider operations center. And uh, it just, people would come in and go, wow, you have a lot of gliders sitting in your glider warehouse. It's very, uh, it's very impressive. Why don't you have them all out deployed? And well, glider pilots, we don't have enough glider pilots. There's an issue with lithium batteries and this types of systems we deploy on. They had a lot of excuses why, uh, why we had a problem deploying them. Well, Admiral Ocon became uh, uh, SNMOC and CTG 80.7 back in August. And in December, I think he had had enough of seeing the gliders in the glider warehouse. In fact, I know he had enough. So he said, I want 50 gliders in the water by February. And uh, you should have seen the faces in the room when he said he announced that to, to the group. We were like, OK. And he said, I want 100 gliders in the water by the summertime. OK. And uh, so we, we did as best as we could, putting gliders in the water. We kept deploying them. And by the start of February, we had about 40 in the water. And we, weren't, we were going to make 50. And we said, hey, we, we got 40 in the water. That's better than we ever have done. And I'm sure you're good enough with that. And uh, yeah, he wasn't, good in, he wasn't good at that at all. He's like, what part of 50 in the water by February did you, did you miss? And so he used a little motivational technique to, uh, to kind of get us to uh, uh, improve our, uh, our, our way of getting gliders in the water. And by the end of February, after having that conversation with Admiral Ocon, boom, we had 50 gliders in the water. And no, we did not take 10, 20 gliders and just run down to the Gulf of Mexico and throw them in the water and say, <laughs> all right, we're done. We actually deployed them in areas of operational need. It was a hard thing to do. It was a big deal for us. It stressed out the pilots. It stressed out the logistics system. But we did it. And it wasn't necessarily through an Antex, or it wasn't something that's a, a technology event, it was just sheer will and determination to say, we can do this. So we have 50 in the water, and actually to get to 100, we doubled that amount in the summertime. It wasn't as hard, interesting enough. Now, people from the Naval Oceanographic Office who did this would say, yeah, you're crazy. It was really hard. And it, and it was really hard, but the mental part of getting us over that uh, hurdle of can we do it with the same number of pilots, 10 pilots, uh, and having Admiral Ocon say he'll take the risk, which is also very important. You have to have somebody say, I know we're going to lose gliders. That's okay. We're never going to get to his goal, Admiral Ocon's goal of 1,000 gliders, uh, if, uh, if, if we just stick with 30. And so we have 100 in the water. And it's not just one time. It's going to be continual. We're going to keep putting gliders in the water, and hopefully we'll find a program sponsor that uh, can help us with the uh, thousand gliders someday. <laughs> All right, uh, so we we achieved that. We're very uh, we're very happy about that. Next slide. So I want to talk about Antex and and why this is so important. Um, this Antex is is not something that we just want to do one time. Uh, show the close collaboration with Newport and then go on. What we did, uh, we did Antex starting in August uh, for two, three weeks, and had a, uh, an event, Oceans in Action, down at Gulfport last week. What we want to do is, and what we did, is take technology that has been displayed and shown in Antex last year and the year before, but we gave it to the operators. We gave it to our operators who know how to deploy these systems, who work with them all the time, and bring it through. And if you liked what you see to the operators, to our, to our military and civilians, if you like it, we're going to go figure out how to buy it and get it into our operations by next year. So I know a lot of people have been complaining about Antex and, OK, we keep doing this industry. It's a lot of good collaboration. But who, you know, we're not going forward and moving this technology into the ops. So for Naval Oceanography, we're, that's what we're going to do. And uh, we made some amazing uh, uh, discoveries over the last week or two weeks, we took Lytus as just one of seven vignettes. If you want to see all the vignettes, uh, hopefully you'll go down to Antex and to the port and you'll see our displays and all that. But with Lytus as Pathfinder, something that they did last year, they went out and did a hydrographic survey on an autonomous vehicle and collected data. But this time, we had a, a spot of water that we did the hydrographic survey, the data was collected, processed into International Hydrographic Organization standards, the highest standards that we look for, 
that data was sent back to a forward operating base where our scientists and oceanographers could see it in real time. And that's data that could be directly sent to submarine ships to be able to, to operate in different areas. Game changing. And if you talk to the oceanographers tomorrow who are down at the pier, they're so excited about this capability because now we can use our survey ships and hydrographic survey launches that are part of the survey ships to rapidly go out there. They don't have to take a team of five to go on the ship. It's an autonomous surface vehicle, collect the data, get it back to the ship so we can process it, and then get it down to the fleet. Something that we've been dreaming about for years, but now we're able to, uh, to prove it. And for Antex, for, from my standpoint, and using the water space that you see on the graphic there, uh, this is water space that's in our backyard. I don't want to do Antex every year. I want to do it every day. I want to take our operators, I want to get them out to the water and continually train, train, train for when they need to go out and do full operations. So you see a number of uh, uh, capabilities there. Uh, our partnerships, our memorandum of agreements, CRADAs, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements. With the partnership with the University of Southern Mississippi, they have set up a, uh, a un an, an autonomous uh, certification program for autonomous vehicles that our workforce is going through. So we get more and more training on how to use, how to build, how to operate autonomous vehicles. And what I knew, and we talked about workforce just an hour ago, I need a workforce that can go rapidly into a glider operation center or go on our survey ship, operate the autonomous vehicles without having a year's worth of training after I hire them. And that's what I'm looking for. And that partnership with so uh, Southern Mississippi is key to that. And. Uh, there's one ship on there that's part of a crater, Ocean Infinity. Has anybody heard about Ocean Infinity? If he, you have, George, of course, George, Ocean Infinity. But uh, Ocean Infinity, you've, you've heard about it. What I love about it, if I could build the dream survey ship, they, they built the dream survey ship. They have eight, uh, they're called Hugan AUVs that go down to 6,000 meters. They have eight uh, autonomous surface vehicles that work with the underwater vehicles. They can put them all in the water at one time, collect data at one time up to the surface vehicles, up to the command center. It even has a helo deck on it. And the uh, Ocean Infinity was out uh, trying to find the uh, Malaysian airliner. Uh, they didn't find it, but they, they were hoping that if they could use that ship to find, you know, just survey large tracts of, of uh, ocean bottom, if they found it, then everybody would have raised their hand and said, yeah, I heard about Ocean Infinity instead of just a few. But uh, it's cooperative research and development agreements like that which are critical to getting us to move forward. OTAs we talked about as well. There's some great opportunities here. All I want to leave you with a couple things. One, Naval Oceanography, talk to us, use us. We want to rapidly field this equipment into operations. And I think we're one pathway, Don will talk about others, that we can get these systems in the water. Two, if you're deploying autonomous vehicles, especially underwater and surface, come to us and it's our job to tell you what kind of ocean environment you're going to deploy that system in to. Uh, if you don't, you'll probably lose your equipment. If you do not know the ocean environment, you will lose your equipment. So come to us, it's our job to make sure you know what uh, environment you're operating in. And two, I beg you please, if you have a, a sensor in the water, take an observation for us. Take, uh, ocean temperature, ocean salinity observation, get it back to us with that location. We can feed it into our numerical models and really do a good job uh, predicting what the ocean environment is going to be like in the future. So, you know, if you have to get your equipment out rapidly, you can do that as well. So thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to uh, our teams displaying uh, many uh, of our aspects of Antex uh, in a couple of days, and Admiral Ocon is going to be here this afternoon to talk a little bit more about uh, about what we do. So, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to you all here at Zanita. I see a lot of friends in the audience. It's good to be here. It's great to be on a panel with Bill Burnett, who has uh, been a, uh, a friend and a terrific colleague for collaboration. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, please? Um, you know, this is panel is supposed to be warfighter focused, so I want to start off and ask you to think a little bit about the, uh, the uh, men and women that are on point right now, uh, deployed, protecting the uh, nation. And, uh, you know, this is supposed to be technology initiatives for the warfighter, but probably your whole conference uh, 
could be labeled that, right? Because at the end of the day, the products that we're bringing forward, the technologies that are out there, we want to empower those folks. We want to put them in a position to win wars if they have to, but to, to deter war. And um, right now you have Ohio-class submarines that are underway with 70% of our uh, strategic deterrent. And uh, you have a, a, a backdrop of uh, growing and evolving threats that our uh, submarine force has to deal with every day with uh, facing declining numbers of, of assets. So new technology is, is hugely important for us to deal with this. And it provides great opportunities. And it also presents new challenges, whether you have to want to employ that technology or, or you want to counter it. And at the end of the day, uh, how successfully we're able to do that is going to set up our submarine force and our undersea forces in the future in either a very positive or a detrimental way. And we want to make sure that's positive, that we continue to build our position there. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, time in the submarine force. I'm now on my third commander. And uh, I felt since the day I arrived there totally empowered to push innovation, to try new things, and to take reasonable risk. And so I also see a climate where we're beginning to fuse the traditional submarine force capabilities with Bill's mission set in the undersea and other non-traditional sets, commercial industry. So uh, it is a, a very creative time where, again, if we take advantage of that, we can make a lot of progress and put the United States in a great position. So uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, you know, we about 2014, we set up Undersea Vision 2025 as a framework for uh, how we would move forward in the undersea. We uh, documented in the Commander's Intent uh, 1.0. This is Commander's Intent 2.0, just signed out a few months ago. Basically the same vision in there, and I think that's an issue of strength because uh, for our thought is that uh, whether you're in government or in industry, it kind of gives you a framework f for development that, uh, that maps the future but isn't so constrained that you can't be creative. Um, the good news is, uh, we, you know, this chart is kind of the grow longer arms. We have increased our ability to, uh, to uh, project greater influence with the submarine and improved our technology in many areas. The things that were just uh, notional in 2014 are now in the program, you know, to 2025 is coming right up. So probably you'll see us start to retrench and think about how you push that vision forward into the uh, 2030s. And, uh, but, but the good news is we are making progress and is, uh, you know, we are preparing for battle as Admiral Richard uh, charged us to do in his uh, change of command speech. And uh, so now we're going to look forward and see how do we extend the vision and, and take advantage of those opportunities that are out there. Um, next slide, please. So I want to camp on this slide for a little bit. Uh, and uh, this is a framework that we've been developing and actually executing for several years. And you know, the key to innovation is to have a, a framework for collaboration, but not be so structured that you can't flex, you can't take advantage of opportunities. Uh, one of the excellent things is, uh, you know, the way I've always viewed it, there's no lack of opportunity. I'm sure if I talked to every one of you at the sidebar, you'd have uh, great ideas. We have uh, wonderful uh, warfare development centers. We have UARCs. We have academia. Everybody's bringing terrific ideas. The commercial sector is pushing technology forward. We have to get on that bus. So that top part shows that very rich uh, field of opportunity. And uh, the challenge for us, you know, you've, you've heard from some great speakers this week, like, uh, you know, Admiral Johnson and Secretary Gertz and Admiral uh, Mers. So, you know, there's long term acquisition strategies that'll field capability, and they're working to get faster and faster at that. And uh, what we've tended to focus down at Sub 4 is how do I turn inside of that? If there's a good idea, how do I push that into the fleet quickly? And I would contend that uh, at ComSub 4, they've been doing that for a long time, small scale. So the issue is, how do we broaden that, bring more players in? And, uh, and then if you, if you get a technique or that, you, that you like, how do you, how do you retain that in the force quickly? So uh, what you see there is we have something called the Transition Advisory Board, which has been there for several years. 
And uh, we have the right folks on that, the resource sponsor, the uh, UWDC, which is the uh, Warfare Development Center for us, and the acquisition community, the CTO over at NAVC. And we, our job is to guide and champion technology. Now, you can't do everything, right? You've got to make some good selections and business decisions as to what might be able to, to be turned quickly, but secondly, has uh, immediate war fighting potential. So it's not something that we're looking at a longer scale. It's something that we think we could, we could get, and we could turn around in a short period of time to add meaningful capability to those young men and women that are out on point. And so uh, we're meeting. We have a working group. We are, we are taking in events like this, Antex, and others to understand what's out there. Um, and then we pull that in and we try to make good decisions. And at some point in time, our commander, uh, Admiral Connor, then Admiral Tafalo, and I'm sure Admiral Richard will be doing the same thing, will choose a small set of, of the potential projects to champion as what we call undersea rapid capability initiatives. And we'll support and champion anything that we think has potential. That's the force commander kind of making a decision and say, hey, that is something that if I had it today, I would be using it. And I think we could get it in a short period of time if we really focused on it. So that's kind of what you see on this chart. And uh, we have uh, the first phase is to demonstrate. Um, you know, there was referenced earlier was a, a, a 3D printer and the idea of putting that on a submarine. You know, I think everybody's probably been to companies that have 3D printing capability now. It's pretty common. Um, and I got tired of going to facilities and looking at their 3D printing capability. And when you ask the question, you know, it's the, the size of a Volkswagen. And you say, well, th this is wonderful. Is there anything that's applicable to the submarine? And uh, they look at you and say, well, that, that's nice, but uh, that's not what I'm funded for. And, and so we have a URCI right now that, that goes and asks the uh, community to put one on a submarine. There are some in that form factor. And if you think about it, there's a whole bunch of spare equipment. You know, it's kind of a mundane thing, but there's locker space and that's, that's taken up by spares. If we can, if we can solve the off-gassing type issues and if we can uh, get the right permissions, which we think we can do in a pretty short period of time, you know, maybe we can turn some of that locker space back to more uh, important uses. So sounds mundane, but that's an example of a URCI that uh, we think we could go and turn pretty quickly. And, um, the other second phase there is to assess and integrate. So again, it doesn't do you much good to have a technology if, the, uh, if it's not going to be used by the warfighter. And UWDC takes point in that. They help us write the documentation quickly that we need to get the piece of equipment to see. You can't send a crew with a piece of technical gear that they don't know how to operate or what the parameters are. And then um, if we come back and it, it, it operates well, it's then uh, how do we acquire that? And uh, we have NAVC with us from the beginning. They're helping us get the equipment on the, the, uh, the platforms. And they're also looking at opportunities to, uh, to uh, find uh, acquisition strategies that'll be rapid. In some cases, it could be as simple as just provisioning it. So uh, again, this is an opportunity for us to turn tightly. It's not just about the submarine. Some of these projects are unmanned systems, surveillance systems. So um, you see a little smattering of the original class of them up there. We've had pretty good success rate. Um, all of the original URCIs um, are, have or are close to being transitioned to permanent homes. And usually that means a program of records, supply support, and uh, the goal is common use. We know we're, we're doing a good thing when we forward a tech technique or technology, and within a very short period of time, the sailors come back and they are using it in a way we didn't anticipate that's even better. And that's the kind of innovation that we're, we're hunting. So um, if, as we hit the next slide, I want to told you I would uh, talk about an, uh, an exam example of how uh, collaboration moves us forward. Uh, you know, uh, Bill's folks at NAVO have been operating the littoral battle space UUV. They've been doing that for, for many years and had them fielded. We were doing a tremendous amount of Remus 600 experimentation, and uh, including launch and recovery, communications. And the question is, this is all good, but how do you make it actionable? And uh, teaming together our two commands, and then the program offices and the warfare centers with NUIC, Woods Hole had a hand in helping us. 
we kind of bundled up the different work that had been done, organized it, came up with new mechanisms like a statement of capability, which kind of guided the acquisition community on how to field it. And uh, we have a plan of record that uh, the Littoral Battle Space AUV S for submarine variant. We're going to share as much logistics as we can, so we're being, uh, you know, economical for the taxpayer. And uh, we're going to IOC that in 19. So from demonstrations in uh, 14, 15 to actual uh, piece of standard uh, force equipment in 19. So that's kind of the outcome that we're, we're looking for. Um, okay. And uh, that kind of concludes my uh, planned remarks. So thanks for your time. And again, thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about the submarine force. We did it. <laughs> yeah. Time for questions. Absolutely. How much time do we have for questions? 25 minutes. All right. We're going to sit here for 25 minutes and stare at each other. Yes. Dr. Burnett, Jay Donnelly, Huntington Ingalls Industries. Uh, with over 100 uh, gliders in the water, is there any concern about water space management and prevention, prevention of mutual interference with the uh, manned submarines that are operating in the same waters? Well, fortunately, if uh, it was submarine against uh, the glider, I don't even think the submarine would know that the glider was even in the area. Uh, so no, there's no water, except for Don about to say that there's some issue. <laughs> Actually, we, we made some pretty good progress on that. And uh, so what we, we working with NAVC, again, it's all about collaboration. For uh, smaller unmanned vehicles like uh, like the glider and some of the unmanned systems, we now have guidance that allows them to, to not be a PMI issue. And we thought that was very important because you were in a mode where, you know, we were doing a lot of experimentation. We put some unmanned systems out there. We want to put a submarine out with it. And suddenly it's, uh, it's a huge concern that has to be very closely managed. But so we have uh, NAPSEs allowed, given us the technical basis to do that. And so that's in our instructions now to a certain size. So uh, as we get into larger vehicles, we'll have to look at that. But, but water space management, that's, it, it is something that we're going to have to have our command centers. There are going to be different types of command centers uh, working closely with uh, uh, the different communities to let them know, just like area vehicles. If you have an area vehicle operating a certain area, you need to let all the other uh, vehicles, autonomous area vehicles operating, you need to let all the other uh, planes that are operating know where they're at and, and what the boundaries are. We'll have to have the same thing uh, under under the water and certainly on the surface as well. Uh, when you look at deploying sea hunters all around the different areas, where is it going to operate uh, the water space management of it? And that's why we want to work together to make sure that that is taken care of. Yes, sir. So I have a similar question of uh, Ron Dean. The uh, transition or the trade off on autonomy and comm between the autonomous vehicle and then the ultimate to get a release ordinances. How has Concept 4 looked at that trade off of how much autonomy you're going to give to an AUV or a UUV or whatever, where you're going to have either by restricted comms or you don't have comms to those AUVs that you're ultimately going to want to be able to employ, whether it's the 100 gliders that are out there or other kinds of devices that might be in the future. How is comms so far looking at that trade-off between comms and autonomy? Yeah, you're, so I think you used the word ordinance in there, so let's put that aside because I think that's the second step. But, the, but uh, as far as that's concerned, it's going to be situational. And so I think that uh, there are times when we, uh, it's going, to, it's going to be a progression, right? And so right now we have unmanned systems that are out there that have a certain level of autonomy, and we're pretty comfortable with that. As we move forward, uh, we want to get to a day where you're, you're, you're basically having a 2-0 presence for a 1-0 submarine by putting a, an unmanned vehicle off-site, letting it, let it go do its thing with that confidence. But we've... It's um, my personal thought that it's very important for us to get going with as much a demonstration experimentation as we can, as we can, because we, we learn a great deal out of all of it. 
And so uh, having LBS doing the experiments we did then informed a lot as we get the LBS fielded and we're now able to operate with those routinely, we're going to continue to, to move that that line forward and then of course you get a technology piece so I look all, I'll turn that question around to you you know how good is your autonomy <laughs> what are you developing comms is always going to be a challenge and that you know as we so then you're getting into you know big data strategies you know what kind of autonomy you put on there what kind of uh, analysis can it do on its own but uh, I believe uh, you know actual exercises and actual operations will continue to build that knowledge base. So we are looking at it, but I think we're at the beginning. Don, uh, Tim Oliver, New hey. Submarine League. Uh, just a question about the implementation of uh, the AUV technology. So what percentage of our submarines are actually able to carry that and how much uh, are we expecting that to be a part of their you know, quiver uh, for being able to use those or is it just exercises and part of our uh, deployment out outload we're at the point where uh, it's we're still in the uh, in the in the early stages of that as well so the good news is we have taken the AUV technology and done demonstrations and uh, we're at the point where we can do a specific tasking um, uh, what we're looking to do is to again uh, I think a lot of this is is changing culture you know, and getting used to the new technology. And so our thought is to put this sort of uh, techniques into our uh, submarine command courses and use it as problems there and kind of develop that tactics. It kind of gets the assessment. You know, if you can do it then, why do you do it? When do you do it? So, uh, so that's where we are. And uh, it's kind of tough to give you that number because you could look at that one way and say, well, yeah, would anything, any ship in that class could do this, but you, you, prob you know as a submariner that Specifically, you outlined certain boats to do certain things. So, Thank you. Uh, but it, some we're working toward. George, I knew George was going to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, sirs. Uh, George of our Newark Newports in Mox, Dennis, Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Burnett, uh, Mr. Hopper. Thank you much, sir. My question is to uh, Mr. Hopper, sir. Where do you? Uh, what's your vision for the Navy's use of unmanned systems? five years in the future, pick your, pick your number, five, seven years in the future, in terms of operation utility, day-to-day -day utility for unmanned systems. Further, where do you want your um, um, technical community, in industry, warfare centers, doing the conducting R&D, where do you want them to be investing and looking at for future technologies in that same time frame? So you're going to, in 2025, 27, you're going to begin operational use of unmanned systems day to day and what other technologies and capabilities do you would you foresee that the submarine force undersea warfare needs thanks well I believe that we should in five years should be routinely allowing submarines to operate with unmanned I mean and, and you can dive into that different ways but I think we, we've laid that groundwork um, I think that's an expectation we have I think today we are operating with unmanned, but I'd like to see any submarine, any time, be able to do that. Um, so today we're, we're operating with them. I think in five years it should become more routine for at least a certain basic capability. And um, I think then where the, the technology is going to go in is to things like the autonomy and communications capabilities. And then I believe also uh, we should be having a, a better payload strategy because if, if we can get to that routine operation unmanned, then you then it becomes what payloads and, and what can you do on the submarine? How flexible can you be to respond to to real world tasking? Um, that's probably a good summary. Tom Chawinski, Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Uh, first of all, let me applaud you, Dr. Burnett, for your uh, success in scaling up to 100 gliders. That's phenomenal. Thanks. Sir. And uh, my, my question is uh, along those lines. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts from, uh, thoughts from both panel members uh, regarding how we take that experience and lessons learned uh, from scaling up to 100 uh, gliders and carry that over into other mission areas. Well, one of the things that uh, with working with Sub-4 and other communities, 
we have 20 years of experience of operating underwater, autonomous underwater vehicles, and a, a lot of uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that we're ready to turn over to whoever wants to operate those systems. And uh, that's why the one of the last slides that, that uh, Don showed, uh, of the knowledge that we had with the littoral battle space sensing AUV, we were able to take the, the TTPs that we developed, work with the submarine community, and quickly get that into an operational component that, that submarines can use. So I, I feel really good about the underwater, autonomous underwater vehicles that we operate, the gliders, the autonomous underwater vehicles, floats, drifters, we've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, what I'm interested in is moving forward into the surface realm and uh, using our autonomous surface vehicles to supplement the survey vehicles that we had, like I talked about. And, and the size of these vehicles are much larger than what we've ever dealt with before. We're, we're very interested in getting our hands on the Sea Hunter, <clears throat> one of the third variants of the Sea Hunter that's going to be built. So we can test that out in terms of operating the Sea Hunter in a water space to collect hydrographic data for us in real time and get it back. But the comms, the constant comms that you have to have with that, the uh, collision regulations, all that have to be developed. And it's going to take some time. What's good for the Navy is if you let us at least ring out some of the TTPs for surface vehicles, uh, probably not 20 years that we've had, but maybe five years or so, we can at least develop a good perspective of how to tactically operate them that when the surface community is ready to start putting out a number of autonomous surface vehicles, just like we did with the submarine community, we'll be able to find some avenues to rapidly get them into, uh, into operations. Don, I don't know. Yeah, I, from an undersea perspective, uh, you know, as the more and more we work with unmanned, the, the first, you know, revelation I had was the amount of uh, husbandry requirements there are with unmanned vehicles, you know, and that's, that's the sneaky thing. It looks really good. You can set up a great demonstration. So now back to, you know, my touchstone, how are you going to operationally employ it? You know, you want to, so I'm, I'm looking to, to come up with new vehicles and vehicle technology that can have, you know, endurance for a long period of time, have higher reliability, so that we feel pretty good about putting something out there and that it's going to stay there, ways to recharge, ways to communicate. So I think that's all systems of systems kind of work that's out there, and I've, I've seen a lot of things. Every day I see new tech that I think, well, boy, you could apply some of that, and that would you know, increase the duration. We've done several uh, pieces of ta tactical demonstrations where we, quite frankly, have employed gliders because we started to look at the cost of trying to do that demonstration with a, a traditional UUV that, you know, you had a, a day or two of duration. It just, you know, you, you were, you were spent a lot of money on work boats. So uh, thinking about getting the duration up, I think gliders have a lot of interest if we can get the capability in them that we want. And then, you know, how do you communicate? How do you recharge? And how do you set up a systems of systems in infrastructure that can uh, that can be tactically employed? And I think in the future, you know, it, you know, the, you, the submarine for right now is going to be key in the near term if you're going far forward because you you have that man bringing your unmanned system into a basic area, communicating with it, commanding it, getting data, those type of things, and and then we'll progress to a future where you don't, you know. You, you can allow the submarine to do more on its own and let the unmanned system do more on its own. But that's just work that's ahead of us as a community. We talked, I heard a lot yesterday, and I've heard it before, making the ocean transparent, it's opaque right now. And one of the issues that we have, uh, operating aerial vehicles, autonomous aerial vehicles, we solve that because you almost always have constant comms and a lot of bandwidth. Surface vehicles are tougher depending on where they're going to be operated. Uh, but underwater, you still have to have some sort of knowledge of where that system is. If, if we deploy, we're, we deploy some of the largest UUVs in the Navy. If we talk about large amber UUVs and all that. The Remus 6000s that we're deploying right now, we've been deploying it for a number of years. We, we just took our seventh one on board and we haven't had an accident yet. Um, but 
knowing where they are, it, it, it's, it's so stressful. Put them in the water, they operate 12, 24 hours at a time, and you just hope it returns to the surface. Somehow opening up the transparency in the ocean with communications, underwater GPS, all these technologies that we re need to rapidly field in, into the fleet to be able to solve uh, a lot of uh, Mr. Hopper's problems. It's, those are those are things, and then the communication in there between the air and the sea, the air and the ocean interface, is another one that's just uh, it's stressful. And there's many many smart people here who can help us figure that out. And once we do, I think it's going to be routine to put autonomous underwater vehicles in the water as much as we do air and surface. I guess we wore them out. Tapped out. All right. All right. <laughs> Right. On behalf of uh, Senadia, I'd like to thank both of you for your time and sharing your expertise with us. And uh, we have the commemorative uh, coins here for both of you. Excited. Thank you thank very you. much.